This next endgame also begins with a decision as to whether or not I should enter a king and pawn endgame. My opponent was a Russian grandmaster named Roman Gingiashvili. We played this game in the Marshall Chess Club in 1993. I had the white pieces. His last move was queen f7. What should I play? You'll notice first of all that the material is even. He has a protected pass pawn on the d-file, and I have a pass pawn on the e-file. He has a 2 to 1 advantage on the king side, and I have a 3 to 2 advantage on the queen side. That understood, I have one distinct advantage. My potential pass pawn on the queen side is far away from his king, and this could prove decisive. Take a moment here. Think. White to play. Would you take the queen? Now, if you think you know the answer, that's great, but I want you to think a little bit longer. You have to do a deep calculation here. Many king and pawn endgames come to long calculations, and when you play a strong grandmaster and they offer you a queen trade into a king and pawn endgame, they obviously have a very strong opinion about it. They believe it's good for them. Now you shouldn't trust them. A lot of players play against grandmasters trusting the strong player's opinion. You don't want to do that. You have to trust yourself. But on the other hand, you have to respect them. So take a look at the board. Study the position. Think deeply. Calculate. After queen takes f7, king takes f7. Probably I want to begin with b4. Try to play on the queen side. Calculate that line out as far as you can. Evaluate it and make your decision. Take your time. Okay. I calculated it out. Play queen takes f7. King takes f7 and b4. So immediately we see that white has a threat. If he allows me to play b takes c5, b takes c5, and then a4, the position will be completely winning. I have two passed pawns, and he can't possibly defend against them both. If his king runs to the queen side, to c6 say, I play a5. If he goes to b7, I play e5. King c6, I play a6. King b6, e6. If the king doesn't know which way to go, there's no way to take care of both weaknesses, and I win the game. He can't allow that. His only option is to take it. He plays c takes b4, a takes b4. And now king e6. As you go through this endgame course, you're going to see again and again the power of an active king. It's very, very important to play actively with your king in the endgame. In the opening and in the middle game, you want to protect him, keep him safe. But in the endgame, he becomes an active warrior. My opponent's idea is to play king e5, attacking the e4 pawn. I played king d3. He played king e5. I was attacking his d4 pawn. So now we see a relationship between the two kings. If you imagine that nothing's on the board now, except for the king on e5 and my king on d3 and our two central pawns. This is an example of mutual zugzwang. Either king that moves will lose a pawn. This is a very important concept in the endgame, and one that we'll see again and again in this course. If the black moves, for instance, to e6, then king takes d4, white's won the pawn. And if white moves, any move that he makes will result in the loss of a pawn. King moves, king takes e4. Now let's return to the game. In this position, it's white to move. We had both calculated this out before going through the endgame, but we came to different conclusions. Take your time now, white to move. I want you to find the best move, and I want you to evaluate it. Let's see how much you see. Think for a while. Even stop it for ten minutes. Let's see what you come up with. White has two good options. One is to play c5, and one is to play b5. Which one you like more? My guess is that most of you like the move c5, so we'll analyze that first. He would have to play b takes c5, and now I have two options. One is to play the natural b takes c5, and the other is to play for a passed pawn that's further away from his king with b5. Let's look at b5 first. After b5, he has to come to stop it, king d6. Do you think that my two pawns can be stopped by his king? It turns out that in this position they can. And now we're going to talk about the relationship between a lone pawn and a lone king. In this position, if I play the move b6, then he can play king c6, and then if I run with the other pawn e5, he plays king takes b6, and if I play e6, king c6, e7, king d7, e8, 
King takes e8. It didn't work. The pawns weren't far enough apart. If I were to begin with e5 check, then after king takes e5, b6, king d6, it also doesn't work. b7, king c7, b8, king takes b8. So the move b5 wouldn't work at all. My other option is to play b takes c5. Now these two pawns are much more effective against the king. Why? Let's clear the board for a minute. It's very important to understand the relationship between pawns and a king. In this type of position, the white pawns protect themselves. If black plays king takes d3, then the pawn can go up the board, e5, e6, the black king can't stop it. Those pawns are self-sufficient. If the pawns are one file apart from one another, they also defend themselves. Let's take a look at it. If the king goes to c5, then white can play e5. Now the pawns create a barrier. d6 is covered here, d5 is covered there. If black plays king takes c4, then after e6, the king can't get back. He'll make a queen. If black goes back with king c6, then say white can waste a move somewhere. Then after king d7, c5, we reach the same position. If black goes left, white goes right. If black goes right, white goes left. The two pawns, one file away, protect one another. What about two files away? Paradoxically, pawns two files away are much harder to coordinate than one file away. In this position, black can by force win the pawns. He plays king f4, say. After c4, king e5. And now if white plays f4, then just king takes f4, c5, king e5, c6, king d6, he gets back. And if white plays c5, then just king d5. Black takes first that pawn, and then returns and takes the other pawn. So we see that pawns that are two files away are harder to coordinate against a king than pawns that are one file away. It's important to know these rules. Now that we're talking about principles of king and pawn endgames, I'm going to show you another important one. Have you ever found in calculating endgames that it's very hard to see from a long way away whether or not a king can get back in time to stop a pawn? Well, I'm going to show you the trick. This is how you do it. It's called being in the square of the pawn. Take a look at this. Let's say the black king is trying to stop the white pawn here. There are two ways to figure it out. One is to calculate it out. White plays here, black plays here, boom, 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 boom. We see that black can do it. Great. But there was a much easier way. Look at the square of the pawn. If the black king is within the square of the pawn, no matter whose move it is, he can get back in time. In this position, you're within the square. In this position, you're not within the square. Now let's test it out. We couldn't get back in time. I'll show you a few more examples. White plays a5. Can black get into the square of the pawn? Absolutely. King d5. He's within the square, and he can defend it. Here, g3. Can black get back? What's the square? Black isn't inside of it. He can't get back. We're still not within the square of the pawn. So when you're calculating out king and pawn in games, it's good to have these kinds of tricks. It makes life much easier. You can turn a 10-move calculation into a form of calculation. Believe me, it'll save you some headache. So now back to the position after if I had played c5, b takes c5, b takes c5. My opponent would probably play h5, beginning his expansion on the king side, because as we've seen, these two pawns have a good way of freezing the king. But it's mutual. My king can't move either. If I play king c4, then he can play king takes e4 and begin to escort his pawn up the board, d3, d2, d1. After h5, I would play c6. I have to get rid of his d4 pawn. He plays king d6, king takes d4. And now black has to make a critical decision. Now when I asked you the original question, to really have had a complete answer, you had to calculate this position and find black's next move. And only then would you be able to know that this position was in fact drawn. The most natural move is in fact the correct one. King takes c6 forces a draw, and we'll look at how in one moment. But first, a lot of you may have had the inclination, as I do naturally looking at the position, to play h4 first. There are two reasons for this. First of all, white can't defend his pawn, and white's going to have to get rid of it with a move like c7. But more than that, white is probably going to end up taking both of black's pawns. On h5 and g7, they're closer to one another. It'll take fewer moves. The move h4 separates the pawns by an extra rank, and it'll take white more time, but h4 would be a blunder. Let's take a look at why. White should play king e3, king takes c6, king f4, king d6. 
Now calculate this out from here. Make sure you can do it. Evaluate it. Remember the lesson of the critical squares. White wins with king f5. King g5 would be a big mistake. We have to shoulder the black king away. With king g5, he would have king e5, and we've lost a lot of time. King f5 is the key. He would play king e7, and after king g6, king e6, king takes g7, king e5, king g6, king takes e4, white wins by just one tempo. King g5 keeps the black king out of the f4 square, and we don't have to calculate any further because we know the rule of the critical squares. After the next move, king takes h4, white is on the critical squares of the white pawn. We know that if the pawn is on the second rank, if white can cover the f4, g4, or h4 squares, he's winning. This is a winning endgame. I should mention, of course, that in this final position, if black tried to play h3, trying to get it to be a rook pawn, white still wins, g takes h3, and black can't reach the corner because after h4, king e6, white plays king g6. Again, shouldering the black king away, king e7, h5 would be a terrible blunder because he would get to play king f8 to g8 to h8 drawing. The correct move would be king g7, shouldering the king once more, and white just easily wins. So sometimes we can outsmart ourselves. A lot of players would intend to play king takes c6, but then would say, wait a minute, maybe h4 is a little better, and would blunder away the game like that. The best move is the simple, king takes c6, white plays king e5, Black plays king d7, and after king f5, black has only one way to draw, king d6. King e7 would lose to king g6. Take a look at it. You'll notice that white's an extra tempo ahead. After king d6, white should waste a move with g3. Now if black goes back to e7, again white would be winning. King g6 takes g7, back, takes h5. Play out the variation on your own. You'll see it's winning. Black's only move is king c5. He keeps an eye on the e4 pawn, and this position is drawn. White plays king g6, king d4, king takes g7, king takes e4, and after king g6, black plays king f3. White doesn't have time. King takes h5, king takes g3, an empty board, a forced draw. And because of this position, going back 10 moves, on the 44th move, c5 would have been a critical mistake. I didn't play it. Those of you who said b5 was the correct move, congratulations, very good. This is what Jinji missed. It's very easy to skip past the move in calculation, to only look at the most obvious. After b5, black can't defend, and in truth, Jinji resigned here. Why? If king d6, king takes d4, I'm up a pawn, and I win easily. He can't move the king, so his only other option is to start expanding on the king side, with h5. But now there's a critical difference. I play the move c5. And after b takes c5, b6, everything has changed. He can't defend both my pawns now, my b and e pawns, because they're further up the board. After king d6, e5 check, black loses. If king takes e5, b7, and we see black isn't in the square of the pawn. And if king c6, e6, black can't handle both pawns. If king d6, I play b7. And if king takes b6, I play e7. I make a queen, no problem. So returning to the first position, the critical moment in both of our calculations was here. If I had played c5, b takes c5, b5, that could have stopped it. By playing b5 a move earlier, we reached this position. And after e5, he couldn't handle both pawns. So king and pawn in games are very, very precise. Don't be afraid sometimes to take 15 minutes and calculate it out. I'm sure you've heard it before. Don't move until you see it.